Live from the 607 is the ODPH Entertainment Edition, where we're talking movies, comics, TV, and more. Why don't you join in the conversation? Hashtag ODPH, because here we go. And welcome to another edition of the ODPH Entertainment Edition. I'm your host, Ken M. Sitting across from me this week is the one, the only, Padawan J. Hello, hello, hello. Folks, we have a lot to discuss. Let's waste no more time. Hashtag it up with us. Hashtag ODPHEE. We got a lot to discuss, so let's waste no more time. Jump right into it. The biggest news of the week had to be Marvel dropping the Captain Marvel trailer on us. Number two. Number two. But, man, did this have a lot going on with it. It had a lot of action. Definitely did. Now, we are going to be talking spoilers, so if you're trying to avoid anything Captain Marvel, we suggest you take a pause and download this episode and listen to it after you check the trailer out because we're going to go into it in 3, 2, 1. Pad, what you think? I thought it was awesome. It kind of fleshed out some of the stuff you saw in the first trailer. gave you a little bit more of the backstory. didn't give you 100% of everything. And it definitely gave me enough to be really, really want to see it. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I was sold on the first trailer, but this one definitely told more of the story of what to expect. The first opening shot was the infamous train scene Mm -hmm. where you see Captain Marvel, played by Brie Larson, punching an elderly woman. Mm -hmm. Now, if you know anything about her background, you know that Captain Marvel is a Kree and their mortal enemies are the scrolls. So what you're saying is she doesn't go around punching little old ladies for fun. Correct. Which I know threw some people off when they first saw the trailer, but obviously there's more to the story. Right, and they make that abundantly clear in the in the trailer. Right when it opens up, you see the little old lady and she's given Captain Marvel the weirdest look I've ever seen a human being give another human being. And you can clearly tell, all right, something ain't right about this. Absolutely. And then you see the fight break out between them. Holy cow. She starts doing like jujitsu or some nonsense. Yeah, it was almost like parkour. Yeah. Like just flying all over the place and they're fighting on the train and then they're, they're kind of jumping around with the flashbacks and you're hearing uh, Samuel Jackson's character Nick Fury kind of doing some narrations in the background and you're seeing that basically the origin of Captain Marvel in a nutshell, so to speak, mm-hmm. that you know that uh, she was an Air Force pilot and somehow winds up crashing her plane that she was flying and she was rescued by the Kree who admit that they were going to take her in when she was nothing and make her into something more. And you see how she's infused with Kree DNA and this how she gets her powers. Mm-hmm. And it's very interesting to see that they've kind of jumped into this. They showed her with the classic mohawk helmet yeah which i love seeing this from the one of the more recent reboots and i think it's an awesome costume design and we finally see that in action and we see her demonstrating her powers she's shooting energy beams off she's flying so she's demonstrating her powers turned to like 11 absolutely because i think if you unless you read the comics you really don't know what captain marvel can really do yeah and her history is very you know very complicated to say the least but you're seeing elements that they're borrowing from different eras of her time, and they're obviously showing how powerful she is. I mean, she's tearing through an entire Starfleet at one point in this trailer. Seemingly single-handedly. Yeah, without any problems. And it's just it's awesome to see just the visuals they do, and you can see her just powering up so much, and she's just firing away and just destroying planes like nothing. Like, absolutely, mm-hmm. it's like a second thought. And as they're going, they're showing more Earth flashbacks, too. Yeah. So they're kind of... you. Know, making it very clear that she has amnesia at this point Mm -hmm. and she's really trying to figure out she was because at at one point in the trailer she's talking with samuel jackson and she's saying or sam's going so you're part of a kree a noble warrior and she's like noble warrior heroes right like she's making a deliberate point to to say that yes because and what she's been almost programmed to say is how noble the kree is and as we're kind of getting the sense in the film not everything is what it seems no and if you read the comics, the Kree have a very unique history with the Avengers. Mm-hmm. I mean, obviously, what this, what I think Captain Marvel is going to be doing for their movie is their version of the Kree Skrull War. Right now, if you've read the Avengers comics, uh, depending on your age, in the seventies and early eighties, <clears throat> excuse me, they had um, ramifications from the Kree Skrull War, which the Avengers were brought into, and there was you know galactic ramifications. Yeah, yeah. And then later in the early 90s, they did Operation Galactic Storm, which they kind of re-followed up with that, and you saw the Avengers take a different approach to when they did the first time. So I think this is how the MCU is going to represent this on film. It's a classic Avengers story. If you got the time, definitely go check it out. And obviously you're kind of seeing where Captain Marvel is now defining her role as being the hero and being obviously... 
from what we've seen thus far, the most powerful being in the Marvel universe. At yeah, least I mean, the Marvel heroes. That yeah, because that's the that's feeling I'm getting off of it. Because you look at the trailer, and this is kind of like her first, you know, showing. This is her first big test, to our knowledge, anyway. And you look at, you know, a lot of the mo- uh, movies prior, they weren't tearing through entire enemy forces single handedly. No. Like at the outset. Even, I, even Iron Man, when he was as powerful and as strong and as much as he can do. You know, he took on Obadiah Stane. He wasn't taking on, like, an entire army at the outset. No, and this really kind of just goes to show the power level just in comparison. Because, like I said, the closest I think we've seen is when the Avengers were fighting the hordes of aliens Mm -hmm. in the the Battle of New York in Avengers 1. Right. And and even then, you had Thor, you had Hulk, and they were still struggling to keep up. Yeah, there was was one point where they were almost down and out. Yeah. So to see this and how how Captain Marvel is just tearing right through is truly an awesome sight to see. And especially if you want to build a character that the mainstream audience might not really know, this is the way you sell it. Yeah. Because hardcore comic fans like Pat and myself, we know who Captain Marvel is. Mm-hmm. So we obviously know what she's going to bring to the table. But for the mainstream audience that just knows, oh, this is a Marvel movie. I'm going to go see it because I want to see Avengers 4. Right. This is going to give you some more insight of why this character was so important. Mm-hmm. And obviously, going in with the trailer, they are tying in nicely, because this movie is set to the 90s, to other films such as Guardians of the Galaxy. Yeah. Now, the one character which I did see a cameo of, at least you saw the back of said character, was Ronan the Accuser. Yep. Which, if you know Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 1, he is the main villain. Mm-hmm. And you're kind of seeing his origin story and how he kind of ties into Captain Marvel. I mean, they're both from the Kree a legacy so, obviously, there's some connection there, and obviously, if there's something going on, you can definitely tell something's not right, because you can see, obviously, with the effects in Guardians of the Galaxy 1, something changes mm. from point A to point B. Yeah. And then you also see Jude Law's character, who I know the early reports of saying that he is the original Captain Marvel, mm-hmm. and this is kind of disputed. I am actually going with the other online rumor I heard that he's Jan Rog, okay. who is a an antagonist to Captain Marvel, and you can definitely see the story. Because I think there's just something that happens, obviously, when there's a power structure and a power battle going on, obviously, between the two alien races that he's just trying to find his place in, and he eventually tries taking over leadership of the Kree. Right, and that would kind of make sense to where we see... And later in the trailer towards the end where Captain Marvel basically, Brie Larson basically says, oh, I'm on no one's side. Right. It would make sense that somewhere along the line something happens that, like, she might lose faith in what she knows or she kind of turns her back on what she knows. She still wants to do the right thing, but that doesn't mean she wants to do it with the institution she was with prior. Right. I think as more as the movie is going to progress, I think you're going to find out that, as, as well as the character does with us, that there's just more going on than just the noble Cree that is defending the universe. That there's something maybe shady going on. I'll say everything is not black and white. Right. And obviously you see there's bits and pieces they've done in both trailers that she's investigating a file trying to piece back her mm-hmm. past on Earth. So they're kind of investigating her and Samuel Jackson are really trying to figure out, okay, what's going on? Like, what's the whole story here? And as the trailer is kind of progressing, we are seeing a little more bits and pieces of how this is going to play out. Because eventually, at one point, you just see, as Pat said, she makes a comment that she's on nobody's side and she's going to end this war by herself. Mm -hmm. And obviously, if she can pull this off in the movie and end the kree Scroll War, which, like I said, in the comics, was and a whole Avengers had to get involved, the entire team. Yeah twice this just really goes to show how just impactful this character is going to be i like the one meme i saw online was uh i think it was ralphie from simpsons where it's the meme of him sitting on the back of the bus going i'm in danger it it was the you know the caption on it said uh captain marvel i'm going to end this war and then it was thanos in the future i'm in danger yeah i mean this just goes to show i mean how important this character is i mean especially with avengers 4 looming right around the corner Mm mm-hmm that this is where they need to really make some headway and really got to start saying, okay, if we're going to introduce this character, this is a perfect lead-in because the time frame is going to be two months between movies. Right, and if they're going to kind of tie this into Avengers 4, they got to explain where in the bleep she was for this thing. Yes, which I think at this point that she either goes you know, underground and is just out of it, or she is off-planet. My, that's my guess, is, is she's somewhere off-planet, taking care of something, has to be like radio silent, or just because of the way, you know, Earth technology works, you know, she doesn't find out about it until Fury hits the pager. Right. Because obviously this is just such a big deal that she's not there when the Infinity War is happening, that he's hitting a pager. So obviously there's something going on that she has just made herself disappear. Mm-hmm. And like we say, 
this is just a very interesting take they're going to do on the character to introduce because obviously we're going to find out why she was not around right. during the events of New York, let alone the Infinity War. Mm-hmm. And especially if Fury is trying to get a hold of her via pager. Right. And you look at the time frame we are in. Mm-hmm. It's kind of, I don't want to say too much of a throwback, but obviously there's some significance of that. Right. Maybe she's in suspended animation, a la Captain America. Could be. When the Avengers found him way back when. It could be. It, it, it really is saying something, though, that she's now been absent for, and I realize planning when Marvel does movies, whatever. But in terms of storytelling, she's been absent for two invasions of the planet. Yeah, so obviously there's more going on that we know about. That maybe she has just been completely underground, and the and the ramifications of this is, of the Kree Scroll War is impacting her getting involved sure, again. That sure. the Fury probably has knows that she's this powerful, and then if she doesn't want to get involved, that she needs to stay away. And then obviously, if she's going to be brought into the fold, because we just don't know the damage that has been going on. Because as has been alluded to, I mean, if you've been brainwashed mm-hmm. and you're trying to just really get your bearings back. I mean, you're not going to exactly want to jump into another battle. So right, because if Fury's got this calling card for her, you know, you look at the the lead up to the fight, the Battle of New York in, in Avengers 1. If he's got cat, some, something must have been going on where she couldn't, ma- you know, be there or he knew she he couldn't call her. Because if you have someone of her power and just overall badassness, if that's a word, mm-hmm. you know, okay, I've got this trump card in my back pocket. I got my ace in the hole why not just call it and why even do the Avengers initiative and not just call her? Right. There's, there's just so much going on with it that we don't know. And like we say, this is going to tie up a very big event with the Kree scroll war in the mm-hmm. Avengers mythos. I don't think they're going to do operation galactic storm because it actually, no. if memory serves me right, the Shi'ar was involved, not the scroll, but the oh, scrolls okay. got involved later. Right. Right. Honestly, I, it's been so long since I've read that storyline. I mean, it was a 19 part crossover way back Ooh. when. Yeah, yeah. This, this was one that went all like all through every single book that was going on. For the Avengers in the time, yeah. if I'm not mistaken. But getting back, though, to it, overall, though, Pat, your final thoughts on this trailer. I'm really excited to see it. It's got me amped up for it, and I just can't wait for it to hit theaters. Yeah, I have to agree with you. I mean, I was already sold at the first trailer of this, but now they're kind of seeing what direction they're going to go with. And especially if this is going to be their take on doing the Kree Scroll War, I'm all for it. I mean, that's a very old-school, classic Avengers storyline. And to see how this is going to introduce Captain Marvel. Because if you think about it, and like I've already said, this is one person taking on two highly strategic, battle-tested alien races. This ain't their first trip around the block. Exactly. And taking them both out. Mm -hmm. And obviously the ramifications from this are going to fold right into Avengers uh, 4, which we still don't know the title yet of. Nope. But this is going to be such a big deal of introducing this character, and it's been long overdue for Marvel to introduce a female lead in a movie. Mm-hmm. And obviously Brie Larson, everything we've seen thus far, she is knocking it out of the park. I'm super excited for March 8th when the movie comes out. But let us know what you think. Hashtag it up with us, O-D-P-H-E-E. What's your thoughts on the Captain Marvel trailer? We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. <laughs> Hey, this is Johnny Moose from Excite Wrestling, and you're listening to the ODPH. I didn't mess it up. I thought I would. Right now, back to the guys. Coming back for a segment number two on this week's ODPH Entertainment Edition, and we have to talk some Netflix, Marvel, Disney drama yet again. Mm -hmm. Part three. Part three, but this one more surprising than the other two. Not really for me. Well, for me it was in the sense of if any show was going to survive the X, I thought it was going to be Daredevil. But it has been announced that Netflix has canceled Daredevil on the heels of a critically and commercially uh, successful season three. I'll say for me the only part, that this wasn't surprising at all. I mean, Luke Cage got canceled. Iron Fist got canceled. Defenders got canceled. Jessica Jones and Punisher will be canceled. But the only surprising thing for me was the executive producer of this show tweeted out, I want to say it was like two weeks ago, might might have been three, uh, that he actually pitched season four to Netflix. So the fact that it even got that far surprised me because I was like, all right, the writing's on the wall that these are all gone. Well, I agree with you. I mean, obviously, we've been discussing on previous episodes about the drama that's going on since Disney is now going to be rolling out their streaming service, Disney+. Plus. And obviously there is kind of some bad blood now between them and Netflix as we're interpreting because first Iron Fist was canceled and then Luke Cage was canceled the day that Daredevil season three came out. Mm -hmm. 
Now, I thought that was kind of very odd, but I'm going, okay, maybe, just maybe they might keep Daredevil because of the popularity of it. And obviously it's coming off one of its strongest seasons, arguably its best season. So to see it get canceled at this stage is surprising in certain aspects, but not really because you figure, okay, if Daredevil is getting canceled, then that means that everything is leaving Netflix at some point, Mm -hmm. which I think is now the popular idea. And I think after Punisher Season 2 and Jessica Jones Season 3 comes out in 2019, that's going to happen right after. Oh, yeah, they're they're gone. They're, They're as good as gone. So then, Pat, let me ask you this. With them being gone, what do you think are the the futures of those characters? Nothing. They they might do something down the road in the future with you know the movie producers, which we might get into in a little bit. But for right now, you know Charlie Cox, you know everybody else, nothing done. They're like as as much as it sucks to say, from what I've been reading from some folks and on stuff online, you know it's it's just too, the, with the contracts the way they are. It's too complicated to try and get them to move to other services. Plus, there's the fact that the Marvel movie producers and the Marvel TV producers do not get along. And to use a kind of example, lock them in a room together and someone's not coming out alive. And that's just, you know, to hear that come from Marvel is kind of shocking because we have heard instances of this happening with DC. Yeah. Because on the day that The Flash debuted on the CW or was announcing its ratings, that was the highest you know, debuting CW show and and I think maybe on on all time. Right. The movie studio had to announce that Ezra Miller was cast as Barry Allen for the Flash film instead right. of saying praise to Grant Gustin and company for doing an amazing job on their debut. Yeah. So obviously, when that happened, you can definitely go through the backlog of certain actors' tweets mm-hmm. and hear their opinion about how angry they were, and rightfully so. Yeah, because essentially you're working under the same banner. Mm-hmm. Like, why are you trying to create create this animosity amongst the division between TV and film? Mm-hmm. Like, it's two different mediums, but you're all working for the same team, and you're all a working for the same audience, right? Because the same people that go watch the TV shows are going to go watch the movies, and vice versa. So I don't understand how you're jumping in there and making it separate, you know, just to say, okay, well, our, our version's better. It doesn't really make a lot of sense. So if Marvel is doing this, which the Marvel catchphrase is, it's all connected, and you could see certain characters jump in here and jump in here, and it's one character on every single f- platform, to see it, that there's this, this much problems, I, you know, it's just it's puzzling to me. Very puzzling. Right. I mean, the thing is, though, like, it sucks. It really does because, you know, Vincent D'Onofrio's casting as uh, Kingpin. Kingpin was spot on. You know, he, you know, as much as Hugh Jackman is Wolverine, Vincent D'Onofrio is Kingpin. But, I mean, this is, it's backroom politics. I mean, Disney Plus, Disney's launching their own streaming service in 2019. I don't know a firm date, but I would guess day one of January. You know, that's my guess. So, you know, why would you want to promote something for it? Because, Netflix has no creative control over this. Right. They're they're simply you know the the horse pulling the cart. They are the delivery service for the content. They have they you know they have no control over this. Disney has full control over this, but Netflix is the one who can control whether they do a new season or not. And the thing is, in Netflix for a couple of years now, it's been well known that Netflix wants to get to a point where a large percentage of their stuff is Netflix made because they don't want to be held by these these studios and these companies you know held ransom for bringing their content to their site for whatever price the the company's paying i mean the example i can give is people were freaking out the other day because it appeared on netflix's site and everything you can watch netflix on that friends the tv show was leaving netflix on january 1st so everyone lost their minds mm. well then it came out netflix announced hey don't worry you know friends is staying through 2019 Asterisk, they're paying $100 million for the entire year for one show. This is what Netflix wants to get away from. They want to get away from being held hostage by these companies saying, oh, you want to keep our show? We're going to up the pay. you got to pay more for our shows so they can have creative control, they can have financial control, and they can really you know, not blow so much money. I'm sorry, $100 million for one show? That's a lot. It's a lot, especially the show has been off the air for how many years? I mean, granted, it is a very popular show still in, you know, almost like a cult following at this stage. Right. I mean, obviously, it was the biggest show on TV during its time, 
But obviously, as every TV show goes through, they go through their highs and they go through their lows, and then they start getting canceled. And if you're curious, uh, previously when Netflix first got it, they were paying thirty million for the year, so the price jumped seventy million dollars. And I mean that's just crazy. But that must to them, they must have the data that backs it up. Yeah, I mean they've never released their numbers of downloads. You just really have an idea of how popular a show is, right? Based off the social media reaction and just Netflix subscribers talking about it online. Yeah. I mean that's just the word of mouth. And obviously with Daredevil being the most popular show out of the Defenders heroes to hear that that gets canceled. I mean, obviously, the like Pat was saying, the backroom politics have just weighed up so much that the fans are the ones losing in the end. Right. Because you have the show that, like I said, is critically and commercially just was amazing this year. And everybody was talking about it and how Daryl was finally back to basics. Because, I mean, season one was great. Season two kind of dipped a little bit. Little. But season three was the knockout home run. It was born again. The fans were all in, in tow. I'm sure the numbers were great. I mean, there's obviously a lot of speculation on how well it did, but everybody was saying it did very well for, you know, for watches and such. So obviously to see it get canceled, and especially for this reason, if I'm Disney, what does this mean for any, or if I'm Marvel rather, what does this mean for any of my characters that don't really fall under the Disney banner? They never see the light of day outside of comic books? Eh, maybe. It, it's hard to say because they have that streaming service. And and I know people are going to say, well, they're doing a, the Loki TV show and the you know Black Widow TV show on, on Disney+. Plus. Yes, they are. But well, not Black Widow. They're doing Scarlet Witch. Oh, thank you, Scarlet Witch. You know, they're doing Loki and Scarlet Witch TV show on Disney+. Plus. Well, yes, but those producers are the movie producers. Right. They're not the Marvel TV producers. Right, but would they even go that route? I mean, because we have not seen with the current Avengers MCU mm -hmm. an R-rated hero That's true. movie. We haven't seen that. You would have to say Daredevil would fall under the... the he falls under the TVMA guidelines. Oh, yeah. So you'd have to lean it would be an R. Yeah. Punisher, without question. Punisher would be borderline NC-17. Yeah. Jessica Jones is yeah, an R. Yeah. High PG-13. Yeah, high, yeah, I would say high, high borderline R. Yeah, Iron Fist, you could probably say could get away with it. Uh, it'd be a soft PG thirteen. Yeah, Luke Cage would be PG thirteen. Yeah, PG th yeah. It, it would dance around there pending the yeah. episodes. But what we're getting at with this is, all right, so you have Daredevil, which is a highly successful property. That if you're Marvel, why do you want to just put it on the back shelf, especially with the reaction the fans get? I mean, New York Comic Con that was one of the biggest panels there. Yeah. That's just putting it mildly. So why would you, you know, alienate your fan base that some of them don't like reading, you know, the good, you know, good guy versus bad guy, black and white, you know, typical storyline. Yeah. And they like their, you know, characters flawed and, and with shades of gray mixed in. That's the issue I guess I have with this is that now if you're saying, okay, well, it's not on Disney Plus because Disney Plus has been, I don't want to say very vocal, but the, the feeling we're all getting is, they're not going to show any R-rated content on no. there. No. So what does that mean for your characters? Do they go on the back burner? I mean, my theory is that once the Fox deal gets signed, uh, you're going to see Hulu get a jump start. Could be. Now, does that mean with the same characters involved? Maybe yes, maybe no. But that could be your outlet. I, th I, I don't think the characters are done forever. I think you will see them in some capacity at some point. However... From a couple of speculation I've been reading is, you know, there's no ambition for the Marvel movie folks to do a Luke Cage movie. There's just not. But I think if you were to see something in the future, it would go the same route as when they were a recast. They they were done with, you know, when they, when Sony was done with Andrew Garfield and they cast Tom Holland. You know, I, I think it would go something to that route. Yeah, I could see that happening, but I guess I would also have to say... With, obviously, the Andrew Garfield Spider-Mans, they weren't exactly home runs out of the park. Uh, so, yeah. thus, they had to do a reboot. So, with this, I mean, the shows on Netflix, to our knowledge, have been very successful. I mean, the degrees have varied. I mean, Iron, yeah. Iron Fist was probably the least well-received. But would you just completely start over just to start over? I mean, that's. I mean, to me, that just kind of seems a little ludicrous. Because you have a successful franchise in Daredevil with a Daredevil that fans love, a Kingpin, which fans love. Yeah. They've now introduced Bullseye, who fans love. Why would you just go, okay, you know, that's great, but we're going to redo it just to redo it. Right, but then the also the other flip side of that coin is, okay, as well-received and successful as these TV shows have been, 
why has the only reference between them and the movies been the incident? The incident. Right. Well, like the incident. Like, now, granted, I would have liked to see him in Infinity War. Didn't need to give him a speaking line, but it could have been like some sweeping camera movement. And hey, there they are. Yeah, no, they should have done it because, like we say, their catchphrase for Marvel is "It's all connected." So connect it. I mean, it just right. it, it just seems foolish to me that all right, if you if you're going to separate everything because everybody doesn't want to play with dice with each other, that's stupid. Right. Because you're ultimately alienating your fan base. Because we're the ones watching. We're the ones shelling out subscription money to go watch. Right. We're the ones paying for tickets to go watch. Now, am I saying that everybody's going to revolt and not go? No, because we all know that's not going to happen. Yeah. But why do you want to alienate your fan base who is very rabid? If you want, if you don't believe fan bases are rabid, um, take a look online about the Avengers 4 trailer and everybody waiting <laughs> for it to drop. <laughs> if you don't think that's a rabid fan base, yeah. enough said. Yeah. In the words of Stan Lee, rest in peace. But my point is with this is with Marvel obviously not making any imminent plans to our knowledge about Daredevil and Netflix canceling it, it's now saying that Marvel doesn't have an outlet for its more mature heroes and villains. The, and I think that it ultimately hurts the quality of what they can do for the social medias or the different mediums. I'm sorry. I think they do have plans. It's just because of the very nature of a lot of stuff. Get the Fox deal and everything that comes with it. They have plans. It's just they, like we said before, with you know bringing in the X Men and Fantastic Four characters, they legally can't do anything, or it will tank the deal. My guess is they have plans. They have stuff in their head that, you know, or they've kind of discussed, but like they haven't firmed out. Like, well, we might be able to do this, might be able to do that, but they don't have anything in writing down firm because it will tank the deal. My, they've got something planned because it, it's Marvel for Christ's sakes. They've got this all planned out. Oh, I would fully imagine. I mean, Marvel's no dummies. No matter where it comes down to, is just everybody's got to really play nice with each other. I mean, you don't the, you don't put out twenty some odd movies over ten years to get to a point and just wing it. No, absolutely not. And especially, you're kind of seeing a resurgence in the different TV markets because Agents of Shield got renewed out of nowhere, out of the blue. So you're canceling Netflix, which is doing well with your Defenders universe. But yet you're bringing Asians of Shield, which well, is, which well, is, the apples and oranges here because Netflix is its own thing, wherein ABC is owned by Disney, right? So no, which I guess makes sense. But it's like you're talking about ratings versus ratings. I mean, Agents of Shield has done okay, yeah, but I think Daredevil has done better, probably. And I'm not taking a shot at Agents because I love Agents. Yeah. I watch it every week. Yeah. My point is, if you're looking at it from a ratings stamp, you know, standpoint. How are you canceling and not making any plans to take care of your ones that are doing extremely well, mm -hmm. but we're giving two renewals as it's now been renewed for season six and season seven yep. for a show that's doing okay in the ratings. I mean, yeah. the playbacks on DVR is what's really saving the show. Oh, yeah. But, I mean, I guess it just kind of boils down to, all right, if everything's going to go through the House of Ideas movie division, what does that fall for the characters that don't really fall under the Disney guidelines? That's the question right now. And obviously with Daredevil getting canceled, it obviously stinks. There's nothing nice to say about it. No. Because especially how well the season is done. And you almost want to say the Punisher and Jessica Jones seasons are throwaways, but I don't think so. No, I don't think so. I, I think it'll – I think there, there'll be good watches. And I will – there is one thing I can say thanks about for their, the Daredevil seasons. Uh, thank you for upping the ante on fight sequences in uh, comic book television. Yeah, absolutely. That ra The fight scenes in that, even if you haven't seen the show, find the fight, the hallway fight scenes on YouTube or however you can find it and just watch those. For me – those up the ante and raise the bar for not just Marvel, but DC and any other, you know, show that has fighting sequences. Oh, absolutely. I mean, the fight scene from season one, episode two, I believe. Yeah. The hallway scene. And then most recently, the prison scene. Yeah. In season three. Definitely amped up the ante on everybody. Arrow is probably the only closest one. They There's, came close. They, they've come close. They've come close. But if you want to talk about fight scenes, I mean, Daredevil has been so impactful about showing how a grittier character can work in a smaller medium. I'll say, because if you want something bat, you know what, crazy about that season, the most recent season of Daredevil fight scene, that was all one shot. Yeah. That was no cut. All right, now we're going to move the camera and place over here. Action. Okay, we're good. Cut. No, that was like start, finish, one shot, let's go. Yeah, and that's the whole thing about how impactful this is because Daredevil has set the standard. So to see it just get canceled on the wayside and just put on the shelf after it's coming off its best season is a little puzzling to me. And it just right. it just doesn't make sense that Marvel now is playing, you know, who who's who's the bigger bully in the box? Is it the movie division or the TV division? Cuz they need to figure this out because who's ultimately going to lose? Fans. The fans. 
But let us know what you think, though. Hit us up on the hashtag ODPHE. What's your thoughts on Daredevil getting canceled? Where do you think it's going to wind up? Is it going to come back at all? We want to know. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Hi, this is Mike C. from I Am Horror. You're listening to the ODPH, the most killer podcast on the planet. Coming back for segment number three on this week's ODPH Entertainment Edition. And it is time of year where DC on the CW does their annual crossover. Oh, boy. Now, Elseworlds is going to be the crossover they're doing this year. Uh huh. Very excited to see it. They're coming off the commercially and successful, I can't say enough good things about it. I know I just botched that statement up, but I don't even care. Crisis on Earth X. It's going to be hard to top that. It's going to be damn near impossible to top that Mm -hmm. but if anybody can do it it is the tv dc cw team i am fully excited about it but every show on the cw finally had their kind of mid-season finale going into else worlds Mm -hmm. pad do you want to kick us off on the recaps so i think we should start with the one that we'll do them in sequential order and Uh, we are going to be talking spoilers too folks so give you a heads up i think we should talk arrow because that episode this week holy sugar cookies yeah Without question, they're coming off the big final, the final battle for right now between Ricardo Diaz and Oliver Queen. Mm-hmm. He's now coming back home. Oliver is out of jail. Diaz is in jail. Yep. And things have changed. A little bit. Break, break it down for us, Pat. Well, I think the biggest thing, surprising thing out of this is you're finally seeing the kind of separation that is occurring, not in a literal sense, but in a kind of... I don't know what kind of sense uh, between Oliver and uh, Felicity, where Oliver is kind of trying to readjust to home life. He's been in prison for a number of months. I mean, there's one point where he's he's in the shower and Felicity opens up the shower curtain and he's so used to his brain is so used to like, okay, I'm in a shower. Oh, somebody's coming to get me. He almost turns around to like whack Felicity in the face and she goes, whoa, whoa. But then later in the episode, you see her, you know, where the home's getting broke, their home's getting broken into. And she pulls a gun out and he goes, this isn't you. And she goes, no, th- you're right. This isn't me. This is who I became. This is what I had to do because you went to prison. Yeah, you ultimately see what has happened to the team around Oliver since he's left. Mm-hmm. Because I don't think he realizes what's been going on per no. se. Because, I mean, obviously he's been in his own personal hell being locked up in Slabgate. That he need that he needs to reconnect with everybody, and Felicity has gone through the ringer this season, right? And he got warned of that, remember? Because the the episode I think it was last episode where Diaz visited him in the prison, and he goes, "Your you know your wife had a, held a gun to my head, and she could have killed me." And I think he said, "No, that that Felicity wouldn't do that." Yeah, and then finally he gets the wake up call when the assassin comes in trying to you know kill Felicity and Oliver, mm-hmm. and Felicity just shoots him point blank, doesn't even react almost. Which, side note, where can I get those curtains she had in that place? The guy was shooting arrows at him, and they're bouncing off the curtains. Well, you have to think about this. Oliver Queen is no dummy. No. And knows that he is a public figure, that people do know who he is. Yeah. And obviously, being a high-profile vigilante, Uh you're going to create some enemies. Well, he's a former vigilante now. He's working for the uh, police department. As we find out, they now have a loophole for him to do his activities. That was awesome. Which was kudos to the Arrow writers team this year. They're writing this year like it's the last season, it kind of feels like. Uh But, man, they're coming up with some really creative ideas. And obviously, now making Oliver a member of the Star City Police Department. Right. Which is and under, pissing off the mayor. Yeah, which is ticking off the mayor. Because obviously as the episode is progressing, he's running around without a mask. Which is so cool. Yeah, which is like, okay. It's like, it's like you know, cardinal rule number one not to break. You know, it's like you hear in baseball, don't, you know, slide into third on the on the set on two outs. You know, don't go around without your mask on. But, well, here he is. Yeah, here he is. And then sure enough, it, you see him progress and he's obviously stopping. You know, I dare I say it was a throwaway villain this yeah. week. Yeah. But it was enough that it really... He had to get back on the bicycle. Yeah, he had to get back on the bicycle, and it was just a little quick shot that they needed to do and just really kind of establish now, okay, what's going on, and they've been doing the flash forwards that you have no idea what's going on with William Queen. No. And it's kind of just getting really crazy out there that just, I mean, they're doing so much jumping around. But getting back to the core essence of this episode, 
Oliver's finally back home, and he's really trying to adjust. And obviously, there's such a rift now between him and Felicity Mm -hmm. over what's happened. That Obviously, it started off very happy, and then he's now seeing the influence. Dare I say Laurel is having on her? A little bit. Because it seems that suddenly, out of nowhere... They're real buddy-buddy. They're real buddy-buddy. And, I mean, for me, this is just... I don't want to say unsettling, but we all know what Laurel as Black Siren has done. Nothing good. Yeah. So sure, the, she helped Oliver out, but that doesn't excuse what she did in the past. Yeah, this doesn't excuse. I, I mean, I'm actually surprised Dinah is actually as cool as she is because, well, I'm sorry, she killed Vigilante. Yeah. Or, yeah. So it's like, hmm, this doesn't really make a lot of sense. Why is everybody so chummy chummy? I mean, they got put up with the, the public persona, I guess. Yeah. But as you're seeing... Oliver is now trying to get his feet back in, in solid ground, and obviously this was a big start that he's now not the Green Arrow, quote-unquote. Yeah. But he does know there's another vigilante running around. Mm-hmm. And we finally find out who that vigilante is. In the twist of all twists. Which was brilliant because I completely forgot about this character. Uh-huh. But it's Amiko Queen who was introduced in... After in the new uh, rebirth of DC Comics, Green Arrow. Right. That she is the son, or daughter rather, I'm sorry, of Robert Queen. Yeah. Which is absolutely mind-blowing because... Where the you-know-what have you been for the last seven years? Exactly, because I know as soon as we start digging into her past, we're going to find out a lot of different stories Uh going on. Uh-huh. And what she's doing in Star City. And now that she knows, obviously, Oliver is out of jail running around, what's that connection going to be? I think she adds a very strong dynamic to that group because, I mean, you know my one thing I complain about the show a lot, too many characters. Right. But I do like it when they interject characters that make sense and when they have some backstory that we don't know. Mm -hmm. When we see Namiko on there, this is going to really add some dynamic to it because, I mean, I'm a very big fan of the Rebirth run of Green Arrow, and I think they add a lot of different elements to it, and I really dig what what they've done with it. So to see her get added to the cast, I think, is going to fill in a role. Obviously, that Thea, yeah, you could say maybe she had, maybe she didn't, but we don't know anything about this character, per se. Right. So how she's going to be presented in the CW universe is going to be really telling. And now they're heading into Elseworlds with Arrow. Supergirl had a very strong episode, but it almost seemed like they wrapped up too much of their season so far. Right. Because it, obviously in that episode... They finally defeat Agent Liberty, mm-hmm. who now goes to jail and is almost like a martyr because he's been arrested for his crimes of defending humanity, quote unquote. Which I hope this isn't the end of him because Sam Witwer is an amazing actor and, and his portrayal has been phenomenal. Oh, he's been great. He's been a solid addition to that show as an antagonist. And I love Manchester Black, too. Mm-hmm. I thought, you know, because obviously you've seen him in other mediums. <laughs> and obviously they they have toned it down a lot for the oh, CW. Just a little bit. But I thought he's been a great addition to the show, and you finally see the, the almost the three-way dance between them. Plus, they introduced Nith Metal. Yep. Which, if you've read you know, anything from Hawkman to Dark Knight's Metal by Scott Snyder and Greg Capullo, you know what that is all about. I'm just loving the little Easter eggs they're planting in. And obviously it ends with uh, Agent Liberty now is in jail, but is you know, still being impactful behind bars. Manchester Black has been in, incarcerated, too. And the president has now asked for Supergirl's uh, secret identity because basically Agent Liberty has just out just won the chess match mm-hmm. by getting himself arrested. He's become more of a public figure to win sympathizers to his cause. So he ain't no dummy. Yeah, which now he's forced the hand that Supergirl has to identify herself, and she she won't. And now the ramifications are that she's now been ousted from the DEO. Yep. And where this happens from here, because we still haven't even touched upon the clone or whoever that is on the other side of the planet that we think they're doing their yeah. version of the Red Sun story. Yeah. So there's so many elements going on. But then we get to a milestone episode of The Flash. Which I didn't know we were this close to that. I knew we were around it, but I didn't... I re- had no idea. I didn't really piece one and one together, but it was the 100th episode of The Flash this week. That was that's good for them. Yeah, absolutely, because The Flash, like I said, I've, I've been very critical about it this season, and I will admit, because I, I really enjoyed seasons one and two. Absolutely. Season three was a little too dark for me. Season two, four was... Or season four, rather, was a little too light. Sure. So this one kind of seemed a little, you know, along the lines of season four. But I really enjoyed this episode. Oh, yeah. Because once you put it into your head that this is episode 100, Uh and they did little flashbacks. Yeah. No pun intended. No. 
to previous seasons and episodes, I thought it was a nice touch, you know, tip of the cap to yeah. the fans. And the one thing I liked was when, because it, during the episode, they're trying to they're trying to stop Cicada. At the end of the day, that's what their main goal of the season has been once he showed on the scene. But to do that, they need, a, they need to create a, a dampening device to stop his dampener because he throws this lightning bolt-looking boomerang thing and it dampens all their powers. Well, to do that, they need all these things from their past. They need a piece of Savitar suit. They need, you know, the injector thing that gave Zoom his powers. They need dark energy, dark matter energy from the particle accelerator explosion when it exploded, you know, originally. The thing I love the most was when they went back to when the particle accelerator exploded way back in episode one. And it exploded, and it showed the lightning hitting Barry, but it also showed the other aspects that you found out in later seasons like happening concurrently so it, it it showed you know firestorm getting made and it showed you know uh the villain from last season getting struck in the head it, it showed all this stuff i thought that was a nice uh tip i did too i thought it was really cool of how they went back and they just showed the different elements and how they got here and obviously i they've defeated cicada for now right but this is going to be very interesting moving forward because during all these flashbacks, we do see a little flash forward. Uh huh. And obviously, with Nora West now being from the future, yep. The, something has not seemed right with her all season, according nope. to the uh, Harrison Wells of that Sherlock is, uh, Wells. Yes, yeah, Sherlock Wells that is on this season. Best Wells so far, in my opinion. He, he he's growing on me. Didn't really like him at first, but I but Tom Cavanaugh is such a great actor that. You know he's he's pulling it off. Which side note? How great was it to see him play Eobard Thornwells again? Oh, that was the best. Oh, so good. Throwback, and I loved it. Yes, because the big reveal of that was Nora West is having contact uh-huh. with. We're presuming Ebon Thorn uh-huh. in the future. I don't see in the th- and a lot of people are thinking, oh, it's the one from the future before he goes into the past. I don't think so. I think that somehow, and this will probably if it's if this is the case, it'll get explained in a later episode. I don't think this is future Eobard Thawn traveling in the past because why would it be? Mm-hmm. You know, he was Eobard Thawn in the future, traveled into the past, and took on the identity of Harrison Wells. This was established in one of the prior seasons. I think this is Eobard Thawn as Harrison Wells somehow surviving because if you remember when they went back to the past to get uh, him to fix the device because it broke. You know, he goes, oh, I can't wait to see how this plays out. Yeah, this is going to be something that we really got to figure out what's going on. And honestly, I, I haven't been able to figure it out yet. Uh, neither have I. And, and he knows because Barry told him he won't get back to the future. He won't get back to the future. He wasn't pleased about it, to say the least. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know how, but somehow I think, gosh darn it, comic books, he's alive. Yeah. And you know what? I would fully buy it. There's so much with time travel and the Flash. We're not even going to get into Legends of Tomorrow, even though they had yeah. a very solid yeah. episode, even though they're getting more more like Doctor Who every episode. A little bit. I'm convinced. And that's not a bad thing. No. It's just no. they're getting a little more wackier, and the humor is definitely in the season. But I think it's to balance out uh, Matt Ryan's John Constantine, who is absolutely <laughs> crushing every episode right yeah, now. Yeah, what was it? The one up uh, the father, the government father dude, uh, I forget his name, is touring the ship because he's trying to figure out, you know, where. all right, why are we spending so much money on the, on these guys? And he walks into, they're like, oh, let's show him the study. The study's a good place to show him. And there's Constantine sitting like half naked and meditating in the room. Yeah. It's just, they're getting so like injecting of humor and just his character, like I said, is just stealing every scene he's on. Uh huh. I'm just waiting for him to get more time with Rory. Ooh, that'd be good. Just the one offs. I just, yes. the one liners in that, it's just so going to be epic. But overall, though, going into the crossover, I thought Supergirl had a very strong episode. Arrow had a really good episode. Mm-hmm. Flash 100. And before we get off the Flash topic, Pad, what is your favorite episode of The Flash? <sighs> well, thus far, I mean, because it's most recent in my mind, this one. But if, if you had to hold a gun to my head and, and not say this one, I would have to say probably the one where, you know, the Flashpoint one. where Because it, it, it's always fun. You know, alternate history is always something fun to read and see because it, it's a glimpse into what could have been. Mm-hmm. You know, it's almost like the, uh, there was a comic books back in the, like, the 90s, I believe it was, Star Wars Infinites, where it was, it was you know, what would have happened if Luke didn't survive on Hoth? What would have happened if Darth Vader survived the final battle on the Death Star? The Stuff like that's always fun to see and read. Yeah, absolutely. My, my two, I mean, it's kind of a tie for me. I love the runaway dinosaur mm-hmm. where Barry is kind of having that heart-to-heart moment with the Speed Force. Right. And it's the one Kevin Smith directed. 
brilliant just top and bottom like it, it, you find out it's the, kind of the speed force because he's kind of having that moment where he's making peace with his his late mother and mm-hmm. it's just there's so much going on in the episode and then captain cold's introduction yes wentworth miller on the season one and i wish he came back or at least if he's not going to come back recast captain cold because i think he's sorely needed on the See, flesh i feel like he's needed but i don't think you can top wentworth miller's portrayal i don't think you can either but it's one of those things like if we're talking about another season of the flash i i really just want to see a captain cold season sure i don't want to see just a one off episode sure cuz it's like that's when you're major rogues and we're not seeing it and we're getting like other you know b list villains and i don't like it because especially how deep that cast is mm-hmm. and now going into elseworlds we did see a little teaser trailer at the end of each episode where you're seeing the monitor is on earth 90 talking yep. to john wesley ships flash which we're assuming that's the tv universe from the 90s probably that would be my guess for the deliberate choice of earth 90 yeah which i'm completely cool with yeah i, I think yeah. That's, a, that's such a cool nod don't really know what's going on per se because no. with the, his being the character of the monitor he's not the anti-monitor right which if you know crisis on infinite earth you know who that is very well uh, classic DC story. Go to your local comic shop and pick that one up. Hands down, you need to get that if you have not read that. But going into it, you see the Flash is running back in time, and this is where we're going to find out everything that's going on starting on Sunday night, 8 p.m. Mm-hmm. on the CW, and they're just going three nights back, back to back. It's going to be exciting to watch because between Arrow, Flash, and Supergirl. Mm-hmm. Legends is sitting this one out, which I'm a little bummed out about. Uh, it's understandable because the thing of it is is... is we know from the show they are immune from when stuff changes in time. Where they, you know, I think it happened on this week's episode where they were reading like the it was either this week's or last week's because uh, I watched them back to back. Uh, where they were taught there was they were reading the back of a serial box. I was talking about like serial killers or something like that. Mm-hmm. And they were reading it off and like, wait, what? No, that's not the case. And they're like, Gideon. And she's like, no, yep, something changed in time. So like they're they're in when they're in the time stream, they're kind of immune to changes. So I think with the plot we know of Elseworlds where Barry and Oliver have switched places and nobody recognizes it because to them, oh, we know this. This is true. You know, this is how things should be. They know things are wrong, but because I think I think just for storytelling purposes Kara needs to be the only person who can tell, okay, these aren't the right guys. Right. And obviously, there's going to be huge, huge character developments. We're going to see Batwoman introduced, played yeah. by Ruby, Ruby Rose. And obviously, they're bringing back Superman. We're right. introducing Lois Lane. A bunch of other characters I'm probably missing because I can imagine that that's not going to be the only surprises we have. And I like from the previews I've seen online where they're kind of, you know, they've hinted at the big three Superman, Wonder Woman, and Batman. I like how they're kind of hinting at it further where they're in, I think they're in Gotham or someplace, you know, they're, they're someplace and you hear Oliver go, Batman's just a legend. Mm-hmm. I love it. Yeah, absolutely love it. So the setup for Elseworlds is going on, like we said, it kicks off Sunday night as we are recording, 8 p.m. on the CW. Check your local listings wherever you watch the CW. Make sure to check it out and hit us up on that hashtag ODPHE. We gave you the recap of the DC TV universe this week. What was your favorite episode and what's your favorite episode of The Flash? I want to know. So hit us up, let us know. You are listening to the Ocho Duro Parlay Hour Entertainment Edition. Hey, this is Rob Kacharek from the band 607, Autopilot Off, and Walking Distance, and you're listening to ODPH. Coming back for the final segment on this week's ODPH Entertainment Edition. And, Pat, what you got for those one-shots? Well, a bit of breaking news uh, happening as we record. So we all know that Spider-Man Far From Home is coming. Yes, he was, quote-unquote, dusted in Avengers Infinity War. But, well, he's coming back. Uh, now, you may be curious, who's the villain going to be in Far From Home? Of course, we saw Vulture in Homecoming. Who are they going to do for uh, Far From Home? Are they going to do Green Goblin? No. Are they going to do Craven? Much as I'd like to see to see that, no. Uh, we do know Jake Gyllenhaal is playing the antagonist in Far From Home, and uh, as we record, he posted on his Instagram a uh, photo of the cover of Amazing Spider-Man number three eleven, The Return of the Man Called Mysterio. So. Uh, Jake Gyllenhaal confirmed on his Instagram account that he is playing Mysterio in the upcoming Spider-Man Far From Home trailer coming this weekend. Yes, and speaking of trailers this weekend, you have some more news for us. Yes, uh, coming Friday, 9 a.m.-ish, could be a little earlier, we are getting the Avengers 4 trailer. Not a drill, folks. Nope. 
We talked about the rabid fan base. We are not lying when we were saying this. We have a little news that Avengers 4 trailer is going to drop. Right. So Friday morning, 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. So however you adjust it as you were listening worldwide, this trailer is supposed to drop. This is the one everybody's been waiting on. Literally. Yes. And then the next day, we're going to get far from home. Yep. So it was a big week for Marvel this week. Yeah. And, and the news that this trailer is going to drop kind of hit my radar Sunday morning. But it wasn't specific. I saw a couple people I trust said, you know, a Marvel trailer coming tomorrow being Monday. But mm-hmm. they didn't specify what. So I was like, all right, could be Avengers, could be something else. And then it came out that, okay, it's, you know, it's going to be Captain Marvel. And then they're like, but Avengers is coming. And, and Avengers was supposed to happen on uh, Wednesday, the 5th of December, as we record. But owing to the death of uh, President George W. Bush, you know, rest in peace to him. Rest in peace. Uh, they pushed it back a day. They pushed it back to Friday. So, and then that's not even the only thing coming out for Marvel this week. Uh, the video game awards are happening on Thursday as we record. And rumor has it, and I've seen a couple people say it's confirmed. We are going to get the trailer for the long rumored, never officially seen uh, video game from Crystal Dynamics, which is a division of Square Enix. Uh, their Avengers game. What that entails and what it's going to be, I don't know. But trailers coming Thursday. Get ready. If you're a Marvel fan, this is a huge week, like we said. Uh And for a video game, please tell me this is on Xbox. Coach Duffy actually wanted me to ask. Uh, I would imagine so. You know, with something like this, as big as it is, I would imagine, because literally nothing is known about this other than it's being made by Crystal Dynamics, which is uh, from under the Square Enix household. You know what? That's huge, huge, huge news. Mm -hmm. So Marvel fans, get ready for this week. Because it's been big already, and it's going to finish super strong. So for my one shot, it's got a couple more movie news to pass along. Uh, there's been heavily rumored that Marvel is in development for a Shang-Chi movie. Oh, okay. Now, if you're not too familiar with him, he was the, he's the master of Kung Fu of the Marvel Universe. Sure. He is a more skilled martial artist than Iron Fist. Oh, boy. I will go on record and say that. So to see this come to a movie idea, I think is a great idea. Yeah. Um, I'm very interested to see a little more information on it. I don't have a lot to pass along right now. Right. Uh but I'm definitely excited to see it because I figured if they were still doing um, the Netflix deal or they're doing a streaming service, I could see this actually going there. Sure. More so than a movie. But I'm super excited to see what they can do with a movie. And I'm definitely you know going to be locked in for it. So when we get some more information on that, I'll definitely be passing along here on the ODPH Entertainment Edition. Also, some DC Comics film news. Mm-hmm. There is a rumor going around, and it's almost been confirmed, but they're really kind of not really giving a lot of details yet. A Blue Beetle movie is coming out. Ooh, okay. Starring Jaime Ramez, uh, mm-hmm. from, you know him from Young Justice, Teen Titans. It won't be Ted Kord or uh, the previous one before him. So this is going to be interesting to see. And for DC, like I say, kudos to them. They're not yeah. focusing on Batman and Superman and Wonder Woman per se. Sure. You're developing your other characters. Like I said, I heard a faint rumor about a Zatanna movie coming yeah. out. But nothing really concrete enough to really kind of dig into. But the Blue Beetle one has a lot of steam behind it. I'm all for it. Yeah, they're not putting all their eggs in one basket, which is good to see because that means longevity. Yes, exactly. Because that's what you want to see. Because if you're relying too much on your Justice League and your Avengers, you, you're really not building the characters that you know can really help sustain your universe. Mm-hmm. And obviously, everybody's hyped about the Avengers. I know that everybody was mentioning about... Um, the Russo brothers were having a conference this week. Nothing yep. was coming out of that except the only little tidbit, which I thought was very interesting, is they said the only movie they would really come back for is Secret Wars. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Yes, which if you're not familiar with that, I'm banking they're doing the Jonathan Hickman run. Probably. They're, the epic storyline, I believe it's nine issues. You can find it on trade paperback, which has so many characters that are involved with a Fox deal mm-hmm. that I'm banking on it. And I'm. They also were kind of hinting that Chris Evans was not going to be done playing Captain America. Right. I mean, if if they are building up to Secret Wars, you know that seem that would be a likely build up to get to a la the build up to Infinity War. Yes. Which brace yourself for that because oh god yeah. If you've never read Secret Wars, it's a phenomenal read. Phenomenal read. Jonathan Hickman does an amazing job, but his stories are very long, slow burn, drawn out. So there's so much going on that when you get the payoff, you're like, whoa. Mm -hmm. And it just hits you like that, and it's so good to see. Speaking of stuff that's very good to see, if you haven't been following DC Titans on the DC Universe app, Mm -hmm. definitely stepping up. They introduced Donna Troy onto the show, and if you know anything about the Teen Teen Titans history, you know who Donna Troy is and her history with Wonder Woman, and they absolutely 
that was one of their better episodes they've done this season. Can't recommend it enough. There's actually only three episodes left in the season. Oh wow, which, that's short. I, yeah, I mean it's really flown by. It's only been twelve episodes, but huh. but definitely it's doing its job. I know next week they're doing a hawk and dove side story. So I really don't know what I think of that per se, but they're going into it very strong. And I heard rumored the next season is going to have Deathstroke oh, on it, which I can only imagine with them being on the C or the T DC Universe app, what they're going to do there. Caught him loose. Fingers crossed, Manu Bennett. Crossover. Let's make this happen because that would be completely, he, completely epic. He'd be down for it. Absolutely. So that's all we got for this week. So for Padawan J. Thank you, thank you. I'm your host, Ken M. Thank you, as always, for listening to the Ocho Duro Parlay Hour Entertainment Edition. We'll see you next time. Mm-hmm.